dollars yesterday in Greenstown. That's what Chief said. And really, Evie, this time his story sounds totally legitimate. It sounds great, KK, but there's one thing you and the gang should take into consideration before you part with any greenbacks. I am, of course, referring to the person you're dealing with, Jinx Healy. But Jinx swears up and down this is legit. It happened in Greenstown. An armor truck was robbed of $100,000. He claims to know where the lost money is. He needs to recover the stolen cash, and then he promises he'll come back and split the reward with all of us. We're talking $10,000. How much does he want for the ticket? $200. If we all chip in 10 bucks, it's a steal. It's too good to be true. When something is too good to be true, it usually is. In the meantime, KK, I want you to write down everything Jinx Healy told you. I'll advise you as to the validity of Jinx's claim by 6 p.m. tonight. Okay, E.B., deal. Sure, KK. Turning Stan into goals sure sounds like yesterday's news, E.B. Could this Healy guy be telling the truth? I doubt it, Sal, but it's the right place to start. What? Yesterday's news. Well, look in yesterday's newspaper. Come on. Bugs and Zool in the library? Boy, this is one for the books. Cousin. Cousin, Don't I gotta talk to you. Bugs. Cousin, I have to talk to you. Don't be so suspicious, Sal. I mean, maybe Bugs is trying to expand his intellectual horizons. Please, please. All right, all right, you guys, but just one and... Oh yeah, well right now Bugs is using his skull for something a little more fitting, a bottle opener. We should have known, Sal. He's just here to mooch sodas off his cousin Lucinda. When she became head librarian, they also gave her the keys to the soda machine. One mystery down, and now for the next. Holy smokes, E.B. Jinx Healy was telling the truth. At least about the robbery, Sal. But anyone can buy a Greenstown paper. If he really knows where the money is and how he knows is a real question. Goodness, CB, is that you? I don't know what got into me. Oh no, Darlene, it was my fault entirely. Ever since I've been crowned Miss Idaville, I've been stumbling into everything. I just can't keep my head out of the clouds. It's a wonder I've been able to keep my job here at the library. Well, you're not the only one who's wondering, darling. You've been stumbling around here for days. I think this whole beauty pageant thing has gone to your head. I'm sure she didn't mean any harm, Lucinda. Yeah. Darlene can fall on me anytime. Well, I suggest you get back to my office and finish sorting out those files before you cause another calamity. Lunch break is over. I'm terribly sorry. E.B., Sally. <sighs> that Darlene is such a klutz. She's left matches burning in my office for the last two days and she's always knocking into things. The only reason she's not fired is because she's Miss Idaville now and I was runner-up. Can you believe that? I'm her superior here at the library, and she wins the pageant. What a joke. Well, she'll keep screwing up, you'll see, and as runner-up, I'm gonna get to wear that crown. I'm never gonna be shown up again by that two-bit, floozy, empty-headed, dumb-as-a-stick, pathetic excuse for a beauty queen. She may not have won the title of Miss Idaville, but I bet Lucinda came this close to being voted Miss Congeniality. <laughs> Help! Fire! Call 911! In a fire situation, it is very often the fumes that can be lethal. Therefore, I suggest you evacuate the library immediately. Okay. Everybody, quick! Run for your lives! Look at 
that sell? He meant the bottles. I was just noticing that too, E.B. I also noticed another thing. Bugs and Zool are gone. E.B., might I retrieve something from inside the room before the reinforcements arrive? I mean, if you think it's safe to re-enter. I'm not sure you should touch anything in the room until the authorities can determine the cause of the fire. It's just my compact mirror. You wouldn't want Miss Idabel not being sure she looks right. You know, in case the press arrives. The press? Oh, brother. Now, Sally, I can certainly sympathize with Darlene's plight. After all, she's a celebrity now. Thank you, E.B. Better cover your mouth, just in case. No press. It's just Mrs. B, the fire department, and Chief Brown. Dad? Everything's under control! Sally, don't forget about the- Sally! Where's the- Everything appears under control, Sweet Pea. Go on home. Another fire! She's ruined everything! This is the third fire in three days, always after lunch. Now, Darlene, are you sure you didn't leave anything in flames when you went to lunch? Of course not. You weren't smoking. I don't smoke. How would it look for Miss Idabel to smoke? Besides, I wasn't even in the room for the last half hour. The window was open. Could have been a spark. Perhaps a crackle of electricity. Maybe even a bolt of lightning. A bolt of lightning? Are you listening to me? This is the third time. She's responsible. She lit the fire. Where I'm from, it's called arson. Find out where she's from. Lucinda, please, these accusations are preposterous. I wasn't even in the room, I was at lunch. Why would I set fire to your office? Because you hate it that I'm your superior here, that I have a beautiful sun-filled office, and that I came this close to beating you in the Miss Idaville pageant. Oh, Lucinda, that's such a horrible thing to say. Now, Lucinda, this is the wrong time to cast aspersions, especially about our reigning Miss Idaville. <laughs> Let's hope so. There's something not quite right about Lucinda Meany. That's an understatement. It has something to do with the Meany jeans. And I don't mean the kind they wear. Dad, we may have a leader of our own. Do you mind if me and Sally do a little follow-up? No problem, son. Go right ahead. But I got a feeling with a little help from Fire Chief Jenkins, we'll have this whole mess figured out in no time. We're professionals, son, working as a team. We got enough soda here to last us a month. Let's get out of here before someone starts sweeping around. The red pole! <laughs> Compound these two back to stony. Say, Zul, it's gonna be hard to pound the boy brain if you keep holding on to my hand. Let go! Your head's in a pressure cooker when I get a hold of you, Brown. I assure you, Bugs, 
The only person you'll be a hold of is Zool for the rest of your life if you don't give us some answers. If you give us the right answers, the epoxy's antidote can be found right over there. I'll kill you! You're dead, Brown! I guess he doesn't want to talk, Sal. But boy, would this make a great picture for the Idaho Chronicle? <laughs> oh, and I guess you can go home now, Sam. Wait! Stop! I'll talk! Stay, Sam. Okay, Bugs, there was a fire day in the library for the third day in a row. You know something. Okay, okay, look. My cousin Lucinda opened the soda machine for us. I noticed where she kept the keys of the soda machine in her office. There was commotion when some bimbo beauty queen lying dragged you with a wall of hardcovers. Me and Zul took the opportunity to sneak into my cousin's office. We snagged the keys, opened the soda machine, and unloaded as many of the sodas as we could carry. When we went back into the office to return the keys, we smelled smoke. We hauled out of there. We dropped some of the soda bottles on the way out. And you left this behind. Get a life, Brown. That's Zool's rag. Then maybe Zool can explain this. He's such a doof. He took a piece of paper off the desk to use as a bookmarker while we hauled off with the soda. The piece of paper was sitting next to a pair of glasses on the desk, so. Glasses? Bugs, does your cousin Lucinda wear glasses? I don't give a rat's when a bagel if my cousin Lucinda wears glasses. We've told you everything to let us go. I guess I told us the truth, Sal. I guess we better let him go. Okay, Sam, come here. Wait, Sam! Go back, Sam! <laughs> Will they really be bonded together for all time? Actually, Sal, that's not really an antidote for the glue around Sam's collar. It's just toothpaste. The epoxy holding them together is actually a homemade glue of my own design, similar to disappearing ink. It will totally dissolve in the next five minutes. Which basically means you have approximately four minutes and 55 seconds to live. Don't worry, Sal. I still got this. Nothing can stop me from solving this crime now. E.B., dinner! Nothing that is, but dinner. <laughs> I'll meet you back in the office. Half hour. Sounds to me like Idaville's reigning cutie. Might be headed for a chain gang. Yeah, unless we come up with a better explanation. Darlene Goodbutter may be trading her title for some numbers. We have to figure this one out, Sal. Number one suspect. She was acting very dingy and suspicious after the fire. And she went back into the room to retrieve her mirror. Come on! And I'd swear on a stack of Bibles that she pocketed something else in that office while you were wandering around goo goo eyed. I was not goo goo eyed. I was looking for evidence. Right, EB. Next up Lucinda Meany. My money's on her. If Jolene takes a fall, then Lucinda grabs the glory. And besides, she's a Meany. But she was with us when the fire broke out. And we trash her own belongings be worth a tin crown. Who's next? The Bugs Me Dancers, straight from their Las Vegas review. Who knows why they would be into torching libraries? Then again, we're talking about a guy who filled a jar with water and tried to sell little kids invisible fish for two bucks a pop. Who else? As usual, the unknown factor. It could be someone we haven't even thought of. Once again, baffled. I guess all we could do is wait and see if Lucinda's office ever bursts into flames again. Only by then, we may be too late. Too late? Holy smokes, Eby, we're supposed to be at the clubhouse! Taking documentation of her conversation with Jinx. I forgot all about it. Come on, I'll re and run. I had to make it like a dry cleaner's in a tense and pressing business. Did you receive my essay? Sorry, KK. I tried to read while I ran. I want to study every detail what a scam artist like Jinx Haley told you. 
He twists the truth like a three-year-old with a water salt water taffy. I don't think I've ever... Oh, hi, Jinx. I'm here to answer any questions personally. The longer you lallygag, the closer we are to losing the money and cheating your friends out of $10,000. Now let's get this over with so I can catch the plane. Okay, Jinx, let's say we start at the beginning. Yeah. Yesterday, my cousin Norton was in the backseat of a bus from Greenstown to Idaville. As he sat in the Greenstown station waiting to leave for Idaville, two men sat in the very front seats. Just then, the loudspeaker in the bus terminal said that the robbers of a Greenstown armored car were in the area and to be on the lookout for a red-haired man. Don't tell me. One of the two men your cousin saw had red hair. It's true. Only it was under a hat. But that's not what gave him away. My cousin heard him say, did you hear that loudspeaker? They're on to me. I'll get off at the next stop. Get the money which is in my closet in Florida. Rent a car so you can avoid the airports. Here's my address. The red-haired man handed the other man a piece of paper. Memorize it, then rip it up. The blonde-haired man did. Look at that! Wow! When the bus arrived in Idaville, the red-haired man had already gotten off. And then the other man rented a car when my cousin picked up these pieces. If the other man is driving, I could fly to Florida and get the money a day ahead of him. Now, who's ready to invest? I am. You can count me out, and I want you. Just one little problem, Jinx. You said your cousin sat in the back of the bus. So? And then you said the two men sat across from each other in the front seat of the bus. Yeah. A small question, Jinx. Wouldn't all the other passengers have heard the conversation between the two men and knowing they were the robbers if your cousin heard them way in the back of the bus? Well, maybe it was too noisy. Or maybe they whispered. But whatever it was, it doesn't matter. Because you see my cousin Norton, he's deaf. He has been since birth. He reads lips. OK, now, who's in? Just one last question, Jinx. If what you say is true, that your cousin is deaf, what now? Then how did he hear the announcement over the bus station PA system telling about the red-headed man? Well, he... I... Sorry, KK. You've all been the victim of fraud. And I don't think the people from 60 Minutes are going to take the time to investigate this one. Scallywag, give us back our money. No way! It's mine now! <laughs> The only flight Jinx seems to have gotten on is the red eye. <laughs> I swear this means something, Sal. I'm sure of it. It's too bad you have to examine the Xerox. Well, I wanted my mom to have the original, to show around the hospital. If it is a prescription of some kind, we may be able to track the paper zoner at the pharmacy. I just wish we could see this better. Maybe we should try it out in the sun. Good idea. I want to hire you. Well, you know, we're pretty busy. You know, our fees, with inflation and all. I don't want to hire you, Brown. I want to hire her. Sally? Me? What for? I want you to beat up somebody in Bugs Meanie's gang. But you're in Bugs Meanie's gang. Not anymore. Why? When I told Bugs and the gang I didn't swindle you guys out of the $200, Bugs sicked his third cousin skunk on me. We duked it out. I hit him so hard, I can't even move my fingers. You should have been wearing boxing gloves. We were. Bummer. Anyway, they kicked me out of the gang because Gunk said I fight like a girl. What? Who is this guy? I'll tap dance on his face. <sighs> Easy, Sal. I've seen you kick Bugs' pants in the past, and that's why I won't fight you anymore. I've also seen Bugs beat up on Skunk. So I figure, if you can trash Bugs, the Skunk will be a piece of cake for you. I'll wipe the floor with him. Sally, please. I'll pay you 10 bucks. You'll have to take it out of my pocket since I can't use my hands. Forget the money. This will be a pleasure. Tell this skunk guy I'll meet him anytime, anywhere. Fights like a girl. I'll show him. Thanks a lot, Sally. You guys really taught me a lesson. See, E.B., the little bit of goodness in everything comes out in triumphs. Yeah, tell it to Bambi's mom. Don't be so cynical. Just be... <gasps> E.B.! I left the magnifying glass for one place too long while we're listening to Jinx Healy's sob story. 
Around this time of the day, the magnification of the sun through the magnifying lens creates almost a laser beam effect. Now I totally destroyed my evidence. Thank goodness my mom has the original or I'd be. Wait a minute. Hold the phone. Go on, I just got an idea. Where are we going? In the past. Sometimes it's the only place that we can find the answers. There you are, Idavale High School Yearbook, 1985. Thank you, Mr. Again. You're welcome. What exactly are we looking for? Well, we'll know when we find it. Aha! Listen to Meanie. What can you surmise from this photo, Sal? I don't know. She hasn't changed a bit. Exactly. Now, if my guess is right, I bet we'll find... Darlene Goodbutter? Just as I expected. She wears glasses. Precisely. I guess you're telling me this means something, Evie. But I'm still coming up cold. It means we can still save Darlene's integrity and the library. That is, if we're not too late. We're, we're too, too late. late. What happened? Oh, Evie, I'm innocent. The same thing happened. I went to lunch, and when I came back, the room was on fire. Listen to me to citizen's arrest, and your dad was forced to take me downtown. I swear, Evie, I didn't do anything. Come on, darling. I think we better go. Wait! Don't take her away, Carl, until I talk to my dad. It's about time that matchstick and legs was taken off to the pyro pokey. She's a sick girl. Hardly the kind of person who should be representing our city as Miss Idaville. I think you made a mistake, Lucinda. A mistake? Ha! I saw that fleeting flame fanner bolting from my office with a billow of smoke chasing her while she stuffed something in her purse. Five will get you ten, it was a cigarette lighter, and Sister Mary Ignite you over there will be doing five to ten years on an arson rat. Then what'd she do? She yelled fire, of course, just like she always does when she comes back to my office after her 11 a.m. lunch break. She's Looney Tunes! E.B., my goodness, what's going on? A travesty of justice, Mom. Did you take the prescription to the hospital? Oh, yes, I did. And you know what I discovered? Yeah, it's not a drug prescription. It's an eyeglass prescription. OS-875 being the magnifying power of the left eye and OD-925 being the magnifying power of the right eye. Exactly, E.B. And the eyeglasses of someone with very poor vision. The lenses must be very thick. Exactly. Watch this. Don't worry, Darlene. Here comes my dad now. He'll straighten this whole thing out. How do you like the new Idaville police uniform? It's very sporting. Your father never looked better. That's not your dad, Evie. Exactly! I knew it! Come on, Carl. Okay, Chief. Okay, Chief. Okay. This is a travesty. Why isn't she in the whole scow? B.B., what are you doing here? Dad, I think I've discovered not who the arsonist is, but what. Aha. Uh huh? huh? Oh, let me explain. Darlene, could you please show us what you do before you go to lunch at 11? Sure. I open the windows. It gets awfully hot in here during lunch break. And I probably take a last look at myself in the mirror, you know, to keep up the image. And I head out the door. Ask her what she always hides in her purse. I hate to say it, Darlene, but I've seen you do it too. It's nothing, really. Darlene, I know what it is. And for the sake of your innocence, I think you better fess up. Well, I normally wear contact lenses, but recently I developed a little eye infection and my eye doctor gave me a new pair of prescription lenses. I only wear them when I'm alone. I mean, how would it look for Miss Idaville to be wearing these big, doofy glasses? I never wanted anybody to ever see them. Of course. That explains why you always bump into things. You're not wearing your glasses. I'm afraid so. You see, Dad, on the prescription, she got the glasses Monday, and that's when Lucinda says the fire started. And the weather's been a bit cloudy every day, but yesterday was a perfect, cloudless day. And the sun raged through the office when she opened the window. So? Darlene, 
What do you do with your glasses when you go off to lunch? Well, I place them here. I know exactly where my mirror is. I get them a little vain. And I follow it right down to the specs. Here's the pair of arsonists. Watch. Dad, the glasses started the fire, and Darlene, fearing not pleasing her public, chose to hide the fact that she was blind as a bat by hiding her glasses, basically harboring the criminal. This is one case where beauty was the beast. I feel like such a fool. I'm sorry, Darlene. I may be a meanie, but I'm not a dummy. I was wrong about you. I think it's safe to take the cuffs off our reigning messiah. What a waste. I've never been able to get such a good look at such a good-looking, intelligent boy. Come on, A.B. I wouldn't want to waste my punches here. That's the guy the bugs can push around? I don't like this, cell. No double cross here, E.B. Look. Trust me, Sally. You'll whoop this guy. It'll be one small step for womankind. Right on. Lace him up. You do, Jinx. Have some business to attend to. My pleasure, E.B. You're next, Brown. I don't think so, Bugs. Someone grab that dog! <laughs> I was about ready to clean his clock. I'm afraid you would have been the one who'd have taken the licking. And I don't think you would have kept on ticking, Sal. You missed something, Sal. The pal Jinx here. What about me? The gloves, Sal. He laced my gloves. This morning, he couldn't even move his fingers. It was all a scam. Jinx wanted revenge for the plane fare scam and was going to take it out on you, Sal. That skunk's a big guy. Bugs never fought him. It was a trap. You set me up. Ah! Sorry, Sal. Like I told you, when the bad guys suddenly seem to be full of goodness, there's something fishy going on. I know. Bambi's mom and all that. You know what, B, that guy's skunk. I bet I could have beaten him. <laughs> <laughs>